What an honor it is this morning, not only to be in his house, in this beautiful place, but to be able to feel the Shekinah glory of our God. We apostolic people believe that our God can do anything, and there is absolutely nothing that our God cannot do. There's no mountain that he cannot climb. There's no valley so deep and dark. He cannot walk with us through that valley. In mainland China, I teach the students and the ministry that in America, when the flag is half-masked, it means that somebody has died. But when the flag is on top of the pole, it signifies victory in the land. And I said, so it is when we come into the presence of our God and someone makes a statement, why don't we just lift our hands and give God praise? And if we keep our hand down here, we're sending a message. Nobody needs to tell. When it's here, that's good. But it's kind of like I'm trying to help Jesus, and Jesus is trying to help me. But ladies and gentlemen, when it's up here, it's all about him. <laughs> so why don't we let our arms soar into the heavens? <laughs> the good news this morning is he's still on the throne. He still saves. He still keeps. And he still satisfies. While you remain standing, just a portion of Scripture, Matthew, the seventh chapter, verses seven through eight. Ask, ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, seek, and ye shall find. Knock, knock and it shall be opened unto you. For every one that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth. And to him that knocketh it shall be opened. If I could entitle this thought this morning, it would be on this wise. He was following me. He was following me. God bless you. You may be seated. Thank you, folks. For those of you who may not know me, I was raised in the province of New Brunswick, north of the state of Maine. We were surrounded by priests that insisted on praying the rosary over the radio. Uh, as a child, I remember playing mass uh, with the neighborhood children. My mother always wanted me to uh, be around the priesthood. So, so I studied for the priesthood for eight years, and just before my perpetual vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience, God led me in a different direction. And it was in the direction of the apostolic church. It was there that I repented of my sins 
not in a confessional box before a mortal priest professing the ability to forgive me of my sins, but before the high priest, uh, the King of kings and the Lord of all of the lords. So if you will allow me this morning, I would like to take you on a journey, a journey of yearning to know God, to the seminary of philosophy, to the seminary of theology, to the Trappist monastery, and ultimately to an old-fashioned apostolic church. When I was 15 years old, I had a heart for God. I look at these beautiful young people. You don't have to wait until you're 50 years old to have a heart for God. You can be eight years old and have a heart for God. There's only one thing that I had to offer God in my lifetime, and that was hunger. But it's enough. If you are hungry for the things of God, he will follow you. Amen. Salvation is God's response to a hungry heart. And so when I was 15 years old, I had worked for Father Sam in Aroostook, and I was invited to the Grand Seminary of Theology in Red Rapids, which is not far from where I lived. And I was invited to spend the weekends there. Uh, I was given a private room. I had access to the library. And it gave me a desire to do something for God. So one day, a friend of mine uh, from the country of Haiti, uh, his name uh, is Gaston Pierre-Louis d'Aïti. And I was in the library with him, and I said, Gaston, I want to be a priest. And he said, well, Louis-Marie Parent is going to be here this weekend. Why don't you meet with him? Um, Louis-Marie Perron, the name of the institution is Latin. It's called L'Institut Voluntas de Par Mariam Immaculatem, the will of God by Mary Immaculate. He was from Quebec City in Canada. And so uh, I remember, now this is it's fast forward, but but um, I was, right after God filled me with the Holy Ghost, about a year or so afterward, I got a job in a little town outside of Geneva, Switzerland, a little town called Essertin Verdon. And of course, Switzerland does not have a national language. They speak the language of the country that borders them, and I was on the French side. And I taught them a French song. I'm not going to try to sing it tonight, but it goes, Je suis heureux, car Jésus m'a sauvé. Dans son amour, il m'a tout pardonné. Voilà pourquoi je me mets à chanter. Je suis heureux, car Jésus m'a sauvé. I'm happy because Jesus saved me. In his love, he pardoned me. This is why I've got to sing. I'm happy because Jesus saved me. Um, and there I had audience with Yvon Car uh, with Louis-Marie Perrin. I went in his office and, and he came in. He had on his cassock and his Roman collar. And he sat down behind his desk and looked at me over his glasses and said, what do you want? And I said, sir, I want to be a priest. And he said, you know, I was in the 11th grade at that point, and he said, you've got to finish your high school. Uh, you'll have to study philosophy, Roman Catholic theology, and then you will take your perpetual vows. And he said, we have a seminary in Trois-Rivières. I could not speak the French language at that time. And he said, you will go there with your parents' permission. Uh, 
you will finish your high school and then start your philosophy. I said, my dad is a farmer. There's seven children. Uh, we had plenty to eat, but I knew we did not have the money. And I told him, I said, my parents don't have the money for those studies. And he said, I invite you. He said, all your studies will be paid for by the Roman Catholic Church right up to your ordination. I didn't know what to say, and I just thanked him and went out of the room. Down the hall was a red exit light. It was blurry. Tears had welled up in my eyes. I thought, now I'm going to be able to do something for God. I did not know it, but God was following me. And I went straight to the chapel, and I got out my rosary, and I kneeled down, and I kissed the feet of the statue of the Virgin Mary, and I asked her to make me the best priest that I could possibly be. Apostolic people, please, never underestimate the sincerity of other people, of other faiths that do not know God in the power of the Holy Ghost. I was doing all that I knew to do, and with my family's permission, I was on my way at 15 years old to a place that I had never been, Trois-Rivières, Quebec. Now, I have heard uh, Pastor Will Banks, even in apostolic realms, that God does not hear a sinner's prayer. The only prayer that he hears from a sinner is, forgive me, a sinner. I challenge that, and I'll tell you why. Uh, one day I was in the, uh, in the library with my friend, my friend Gaston, and uh, Bishop Gagnon was going to be there that weekend. The bishop of the Roman Catholic Church uh, is the prince of the church. He wears a ruby ring on his right hand. When you greet him, you kneel down and you kiss his ring as a sign of your uh, subjection to his authority. And he said, are you, are you going to uh, meet uh, Bishop Gagnon tonight? And I said, no. He said, I am. Why aren't you? Not that I had not before. I said, I'm going to tell you why, Gaston, and you're not going to like it. I said, I just don't think it's right for one man to kneel down and kiss the ring of another man. Could that have been God following me at the seminary? It was not until after God filled me with the Holy Ghost, where I read where Peter went down to Cornelius' house, and Cornelius came down from prayer and fell down before him, and the Bible said began to worship him. Peter took him by the hand and said, Stand up. I myself also am a man. If you're going to give praise, give praise to God. If you're going to... If you're going to give honor, give honor to the one that deserves honor, and that is to the King of kings and to the Lord of all of the lords. When, when I arrived in Trois-Rivières, Quebec, I went with, there was like 20 other uh, students in the van. We got to Trois-Rivières, Quebec, and I finished my high school uh, at an English hospital, uh, hos, uh, school in Trois-Rivières. Uh, but when I was there, something happened. Something that I believed then was divine and something that I believe today was divine. I was in the chapel, I was by myself, I had the lights down, candle was lit that signified the presence of the Christ in the tabernacle. We believed in transubstantiation, and I was praying to the Virgin Mary and the medieval saints, and all of a sudden, I could hear someone breathing 
by my side, but I knew I was alone. I was still a teenager, and it startled me. I got up, turned the light on. There was no one in the room. I went back to the sacristy. There was no one there. Now that I have the Holy Ghost, I believe it was an angel. God was following me that was standing beside me. I believe in the intercessory prayers of the saints of God. There was a father in the faith somewhere on earth. There was a mother in Zion somewhere on earth that had a hold of the altar, and they were praying for someone. They were interceding for someone they did not know. Well, I marked it down as a figment of my imagination. I went to my room. I had, we had private rooms. Uh, I got ready for bed, turned out the light, found a comfortable spot in my bed, and from inside the room, as a Roman Catholic seminarian, I believe I heard the audible voice of God, and God called my name, not once, but twice. I was so afraid. I could hear my heart beating in my throat. Finally, I got up enough nerve to get up on my elbow. I went to the light, and there was no one in the room. But now that I have the Holy Ghost, I know that he was following me. After I finished my philosophical studies um, in Trois-Rivières, I was to join the Brothers of Charity of the Immaculate Heart of Mary in Riverside, California. Last year, I preached uh, for Brother Brown in Riverside, California, this Jesus name apostolic message uh, where I studied for the priesthood 51 years earlier. <laughs> Brother Booker and I went to the Catholic Church, St. Thomas um, uh, there in Riverside uh, where, uh, where I studied and helped there with the ministry. Uh, the priest, we, we, I caught him going across the road, so I asked him to open the church up. We went in, and Brother Booker was standing there, and, and I just got down on my knees, and I began to worship God before that altar and thank God and Brother Booker told me afterward, he said, that priest was watching you. And I said, the only thing that could happen would be of benefit to that priest. Uh, amen. Amen. So, so anyway, I, I went to Riverside, and there I would study Roman Catholic theology. Well, this is fast forward I'm now 23 years old. I'm ready to take my perpetual vows, uh, namely poverty would mean that I could drive a car, but I could not own one. I could live in a house, but I could not own one. Chastity would mean that I could never marry. And let me just stop for a moment. God has given me the most wonderful woman on the planet, 48 years of marriage. We have two Holy Ghost-filled children and three beautiful grandchildren. Is there a man in the house that could lift your hand and say, I'm blessed? I'm a blessed man. Come on, somebody. Come on, somebody. And obedience then would mean that I would be obedient to my bishop, to the cardinal, uh, the Roman Curia, and ultimately to the pontiff in Rome. A couple of years ago when I was in Rome, I went back to the Vatican, and I was able to present a copy of From Rome to Jerusalem to Pope Francis I uh, through his secretary. He wrote me a letter thanking me for the work. Now, I gave it to him in his uh, Spanish language, and 
if he reads it, and I believe he will, and if for no other reason to find out why so many Catholic people are leaving the faith uh, and joining the apostolics, uh, but if he reads the book and he obeys the book and he repents uh, and he's baptized in Jesus' name and filled with the Holy Ghost, uh, then and only then can he profess to be the true successor of Peter. Uh, I want to tell you who the true successors of Peter are. Are. They are the Jesus name, apostolic, tongue-talking, Holy Ghost-filled people uh, that preach what Peter taught. Uh, can we lift our, come on, somebody. Come on, let's, let's get them up. Let's get them up. Let's lift our hands uh, and give him praise. Uh, I'm talking about the King of Kings. Uh, I'm talking about the Lord of Lords. Amen. I was a devout Roman Catholic. I went to Mass at least seven times a week. Sometimes we'd have my Mass twice in a day. And I, would, I was an avid supporter of the medieval saints and the mother, the Madonna, the mother of Jesus. Could I stop just for a moment, Pastor Will Banks, and address the issue about Mary the mother of Jesus. I was taught and did teach at the seminary that she was the mediatrix between humanity and divinity, that she, along with her son Jesus, atones for our sins. There's only one mediator, and that is Jesus Christ. John, uh, John was baptizing, and he stopped, uh, and he saw Jesus coming down the road, and he turned, and he said, Behold, uh, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. Mary never wanted to be a statue in God's house. But to the contrary, she was a humble servant of the Lord. She found favor with God before the Annunciation. When she walked up to uh, her cousin Elizabeth's house, Elizabeth said, Who am I? that the mother of my Lord should come and visit me. And her response was very humble. She said, my soul doth magnify the Lord, and I have rejoiced in God my Savior. Pastor Wilbanks, help me out. Was she not there on the day of Pentecost? Mary, the mother of Jesus, received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. We received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Mary was baptized in her son's name. We were baptized in her son's name. Mary spoke in tongues as the Spirit of God gave the utterance. We spoke in tongues as the Spirit of God gave the utterance. Do you really want to know who G or her Mary was? She was a Jesus name, apostolic, tongue tongue. Come on, is there an apostolic in the house? Well, one night in Riverside, I had the lights out. I, I always did that to take away the tangible. I was on my knees. I was reciting the rosary. And all of a sudden, as a Roman Catholic, once again, I believe I heard the audible voice of God. And this time, God said, don't take those vows. I didn't know what was happening, but I knew I had somehow come in contact with the divine. He was following me through the seminary of theology. My head immediately went to the floor, and just in a few moments' time, there were two puddles of water on the floor. God washed my eyes with tears. Uh, the next morning, I went into the head of the novitiate. His name was Timothy, 
And he said, are you ready for your vows? And I said, Timothy, there's not going to be any vows. It, it, it was kind of like you're, you're about to walk across the stage to receive your doctorate's degree. And you hear a voice, and the voice says, don't do that. All my life, eight intense years, I love the Mother Church. I love my traditions. I love my ritualisms. And he said, what's going on? I said, Timothy, there's something else that we don't have. He said, what is it? I said, I don't know. But I feel in my spirit that there's something else that we don't have. He said, there is nothing else. He said, I want you to go to Banning, to the retreat house. We had a swimming pool, palm trees. Um, he said, everything is clean. I will have two weeks of groceries delivered. You need a good rest. He said, we're all tired. I said, no, Timothy. I felt tears well up in my eyes. I said, no, Timothy. I don't need a rest. I need some answers in my life. So against his better judgment, he gave my good friend David, who is now a bishop in Anaheim, California, tickets from Los Angeles to Montreal. And when we got in the air, I, I, was, I was quietly excited. I, I, you know, when, when you hear about people hearing voices, it, it can be scary. I didn't want... I didn't want to make people think I was having a mental breakdown or something. But David said, why are we going to Montreal? I said, David, there's something else. And I'm going to find it. Even on that airplane, God was following me. And when I said, I believe now God wants me to be a Trappist monk. These monks are, are uh, cloistered. Um, we talk about the things, television. We didn't have television. We didn't have radio. We didn't have a newspaper. If there was a death in the family, a family member would come, and there would be a black screen. They would tell us about the death. There would be no communication. Then the, the monk would go on to his post. I said, I believe God wants me to be a Trappist monk. And so he said, well, maybe when we got to the airport, we had a modest but tasty lunch. He said, maybe you were homesick for Canadian soil. He said, we need to go back home. He said, I don't think you need to be a monk. And I said, no, I'm going to go to the Trappist Monastery. So he went back to Los Angeles, and I went to the Trappist Monastery, which is northwest of Montreal. When I got there, the abbot met me at the door. I had been there before. He knew Louis-Marie Parent. He knew Yvon Carpentier. And uh, I said, I believe God wants me to be a monk. And he said, you come in. You spend the rest of your life in this house. These are theologians. And so there I became a monk and, and uh, began to s chant the Psalms of David. Uh, our day started at 3 o'clock in the morning. We prayed for two hours before our breakfast. We were vegetarians. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please, if your pastor asks you to come early to pray, he's not picking on you. He's not trying to intimidate you. But he knows outside those doors there are wolves that would like to take your joy, that would like to take your peace, that would like to take everything that God has given you. And so uh, outside the abbey, there was a graveyard of the deceased monks. It was a favorite place to pray. And one day I was out there and I was reciting my rosary. And I was walking among the tombs, literally walking among the dead. Pastor Wilbanks, I'm so glad in Coleman that I'm walking among the living. <laughs> I'm talking about the Jesus name apostolic people uh, that gave their lives uh, 
totally, utterly unto God. And I was praying out there, and I was thinking, God, I'm tired of ritualism. I'm tired of formality. I'm tired of going in a confessional box, receiving a penance and absolution. I, I'm, after a while, I realized that, that 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 life was not for me, so I went, I left the Trappist Monastery and uh, went to trois Quebec, Notre Dame du Cap in Cape de la Madeleine. Sister Hanscom and I have been there a couple of times. I think there's maybe 19 or 20 concrete steps that goes up to this massive um, building that was dedicated to Our Lady of the Cape. It's called Notre Dame du Cap. And during novenas, uh, as seminarians, we would get on our knees, and priests, we would get on our knees, walk across the parking lot and up those concrete steps till we got to the foot of the large statue of the Madonna. We may not realize it in full, but one day we are going to stand in judgment with those people. I, I want to be obedient to God, don't you? Let's lift our hands and ask him. I went back to New Brunswick on the East Coast, north of Maine, and I walked into my good friend Leo Gregoire. He was the priest of Plaster Rock. I went in and he said, what are you doing here? And he was planning on going to my ordination a few months down the road. And I said, Leo, there's something else. God was following me. But everybody that I talked to said there is nothing else. And Leo was a chain smoker. He was lighting one cigarette after the other, telling me there was nothing else. If Leo Gregoire had the Holy Ghost, he wouldn't have to smoke those things. No, you didn't understand what I said. I said if Leo Gregoire had the Holy Ghost, he wouldn't have to smoke those things. But there was something else. And we talked a few days. And, and finally, he convinced me to go back to uh, California and take the perpetual vows. Well, this was in September 1972. And uh, he could not leave the seminary. He had some juvenile delinquents there. And he was the only adult. Uh, the theologians had not arrived. The professors had not gotten there for the fall semester. And, but it wasn't a problem. In 1972, I don't know how it was in, in uh, uh, Coleman, but back there, hitchhiking was popular. So I said, it's not a problem. I'll go down to the road. I will hitchhike to Perth, get on the bus, take the bus to Montreal, and then I had my return ticket to Los Angeles. So when I stepped outside of the door, I knew I was going back to California, but I knew I wasn't going back to California. I walked down to the road, and this was country. I'm talking about cows walking down the street type country. There was no, there, night had already claimed the day, and there were no cars. There were none. I remembered a town called Plaster Rock. I had never been there before, but it was a pulp town. And I'm thinking, okay, I've still got a couple months or so before my ordination. I will go to that town, get a job, save my money. Then I will go to Presque Isle, Maine, and fly from Presque Isle to Montreal, and then on to Los Angeles, which would save me that four or 500 mile bus ride. I went on the other side of the road, and immediately the lights of a car penetrated the darkness. Stopped right where I was at and asked me where I was going. I said, Plaster Rock. He said, put your bags in the back and get in with me. For 
30 miles, he never spoke a word. But every once in a while, he would look right in my face as to, to say, I know who you are, and everything is going to be all right. God was following me. Then the next day and today, I am persuaded it was an angel dispatched from the throne of God driving that automobile. He let me out in the little town, and I'm talking about, Pastor, have you been there before? Okay, it's a small town. And uh, so there were some teenagers there, and I said, do y'all know where I could get an inexpensive hotel? I said, I I've got some money, don't want to spend it. One boy spoke up, and he said, there are two hotels in town. And he says, but there's a Pope convention. You're not going to get a room. And when I talked about two hotels in Plaster Rock in 1972, I'm talking about two big buildings with a lot of bedrooms and maybe a couple bathrooms. Very poor. But he said, my dad has got a log cabin out in the woods. About a quarter of a mile or so, you're welcome to go there. And I felt at that time, I need some me time. If, if, if God didn't want me to take my perpetual vows, if I wasn't supposed to be a Trappist monk, what, what is it? I, I've got, to, I needed some me time. I needed some, I needed some answers. And I thanked him. We walked out to the, through the woods. Actually, there was a little bit of snow on the ground. We got to this somewhat dilapidated log cabin. And I thanked him. He went nonchalantly in the other direction. I went inside and I lit a candle. There was a stove, but there was no chimney. There was no food to be seen. There was a bed, a single bed, but there was no mattress. You could see the floor through the springs. There were empty beer cans around the rafters, and I presumed days gone by snowmobile parties. I didn't know. But I wasn't hungry, and I wasn't tired. I needed some answers, and I began to pray, and I took out my rosary, and and I prayed to the Virgin Mary in English. I prayed to her in Latin. I prayed to her in French. Nothing. Uh, I walked the floor. I read my bravery, a prayer book. Nothing. But about 1 o'clock in the morning, I set my rosary down on that nightstand, and I got down on my knees in front of that old bed. And I'm not ashamed to say it. It was like yesterday. Yesterday, I cried. I was 23 years old, and I cried, and I said, God, if there's a God in heaven, I need some answers in my life. I got up on the springs on that bed and uh, one of my little bags, and I made it a pillow. I fell asleep. God gave me a dream, and the dream was divine. I dreamt that I was drowning in a lake. I had fought the waves. There were mountains on both sides of the lake. I had fought the waves, and I knew in that dream, if I go down, I'm not coming back. I was so weak. All of a sudden, I saw a humongous hand coming over the mountains. It was bigger than the mountains. It was like it could take a top off the mountain and cast it in the lake. And that hand was coming toward me. And in that dream, I was thinking, it's so big and it's so strong. I'm so small and I'm so weak, it's going to drown me. But instead of drowning me, it plucked me out of the water and it set my feet on the shore. God was showing me his incarnation. Jesus Christ and the Holy Ghost were the hands of God reaching down from the infinite to the finite. Uh, aren't you glad he looked beyond our faults? Uh, can we lift our hands? Come on, can we lift our hands unto him again? The next morning, I was on my way to St. Thomas Aquinas. I did not know any apostolic people. Uh, there was a movement in the 60s of 
people in the Catholic Church getting talking in tongues, but I shunned it. I stayed away. I didn't. I believed if you're going to be Catholic, you need to be Catholic. But I also believe with Sister Hanscom, if you're going to be apostolic, you need to be apostolic. And so, and so uh, the next morning, I put my rosary in my pocket. I was on my way to St. Thomas Aquinas uh, Catholic Church. It was going to be a high mass that morning. Walked out of the woods. Well, in Plaster Rock, there's a small main road, and then there's a little road that goes down, and it crosses the Tobik River. The Tobik River is not that wide, but it's fast-flowing. And I walked out into the middle of the bridge, and I stared aimlessly into the fast-flowing water, and the thought came to my mind, if I fell in the water, how far downstream would they find my body? Suicidal thoughts are from hell. It only happened to me once in my lifetime, but it happened to me 51 years ago. That same morning, God filled me with the Holy Ghost. So the question came to mind, what was God trying to do and what was Satan trying to do? So I walked off the bridge and I walked down the street and I came to the driveway that led to the Catholic Church, and I just stopped. And again, I said, God, I'm tired. I'm tired of ritualism. I'm tired of formality. I'm tired of going in a confessional boss, confessing my sins to a mortal priest, professing the ability to forgive me of my sins, receiving a penance and absolution, going out doing the same thing. I said, God, I need some strength. And right then, as a Roman Catholic, I felt myself, it was almost like slow motion, but God was following me. It was like slow motion, and, and I remember thinking, am I having a nervous breakdown? But from in that, I heard the audible voice of God, and God said, down the road, there's an apostolic church. I've never been, I was never in the town before, didn't know any apostolic people. But I looked up at the mother church, not wanting to do her a disservice, but started walking down the road. And I got to the end of the town. I was about ready to go back to Mass when I looked at a sign, a little country church down in the holler, and it said, Holiness Apostolic Church, James D. McKillop, Pastor. I said that word apostolic. I knew that the Vatican was known as the Apostolic Palace, and there was nobody outside. I walked up to the door. I didn't know if I should go in or if I should go back to Mass. And the question came to my mind, who's interpreting the Word of God in that house? To me, the Roman Curia, the, 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 the College of Cardinals and the Pope are the only ones that have the right to interpret the Word of God. I had a choice. Do I go in or do I go back to Mass? But knowing somewhere there was something else, I went in. And I sat down on the back pew. I made myself as small as I could. First thing I noticed, there were no statues. In the most modern Roman Catholic Church is a statue of the Mother of Jesus. Ladies and gentlemen, God does not want statues in His house. He wants real men and real women and real young men and real young women worshiping him in the spirit and worshiping him in the truth. The next thing I noticed was there was no altar. That's a large table. Uh, we believed in transubstantiation where the wafer is changed to the body and the wine to the literal blood of Christ. Somebody came to the pulpit. He did not have priestly vestments on that I was accustomed to. He had a business suit. And I edged up on my pew so anxious to hear what he had to say, but he didn't say anything. 
he just threw back his head as the musicians played. And he sang the songs of Zion. The first song he sang was, Jesus is coming down the road. He will save and he will heal. Just believe him and he will. I didn't know what was going on, but I had just walked down the road. And I was made uh, aware of the fact that he was following me, not only gave me direction to his house, but walked me to the door of his house. And he knew in that house was everything that I would need to make me happy in this life uh, and the power to take me home when it was over. There was salvation in the house. There was healing in the house. There was peace in the house. There was joy in the house. So someone mentioned Isaiah 9 and 6. It maybe was coincidental. I don't know, but there was a Bible laying right beside me, and I picked it up. Isaiah 9 and 6, it was the interpretation of the dream that I had less than eight hours earlier. You see, the Trappist Monastery sits on a lake, and there are mountains on both sides of the lake. It's called Lac Le de Montagne. God was showing me that I was drowning in man-made religious Christianity. And, and, and so I picked it up, and, and, and the man mentioned Isaiah 9 and 6. Unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. The government will be on his shoulder and his name. We know that Jesus was his name. And his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. So you see, in the first century church, this Jesus was known as Jesus the Wonderful, Jesus the Counselor, Jesus the Mighty God, Jesus the Everlasting Father, and Jesus the Prince of Peace. Oh, let's stand to our feet. Come on, somebody. Let our arms soar one more time. Come on, somebody. You may be seated. They began to sing. For the first time in my 23 years of living, Pastor, I was honored to feel with the redeemed the Shekinah glory of God. Another man came to the pulpit, later known as the pastor, James D. McKillop, and he said, Folks, there's a blind man in the house. Not physically blind, but spiritually blind. And God is going to open his eyes this morning. He invited that whole church to turn. I saw them turn and go to their knees. And they lifted their hands with effortless grace. I saw tears begin to flow. I, 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 stood, I stood there. I didn't want to lift my hands just because they did. But I remember asking God, God, would you make it? God, would you make it where I could lift my hands the way they lift their hands? Another man left the pulpit and came down where I was, Daniel's dad, Dana. And, and he said, son, do you want to go to the altar? I said, sir, I don't know where the altar is, but I want to go. When Dana put his hand on my shoulder, I was so hungry that tears literally gushed out of my eyes. When I got to the front, he said, kneel here. And my familiarity with the priesthood made me realize I was not kneeling in a confessional box, but I was kneeling before the high priest, uh, the king of all of the kings uh, and the Lord of all of the lords. Uh, I repented. Pastor Wilbanks, I'm going to make the devil mad just now, but I've kind of enjoyed that over the last 51 years. I repented and I meant it. Yeah. 
You see, you've got to mean it. I teach in China. I teach the four steps of salvation. Repentance. I'm going to get back to the story in just a minute. Repentance, which is essential to salvation, but it's not enough. Baptism in Jesus' name, which is essential to salvation, but it's not enough. The infilling of the Holy Ghost, which is essential to salvation, but it's not enough. Elder, what could be more important than God in us, the hope of glory? There's one thing that's more important than God in us, the hope of glory, and that's step number four, having your mind made up. Because if you don't have your mind made up, you can lose your Holy Ghost. You can lose your joy. You can lose your peace. But could I tell you this morning, if you've got your mind made up, there's not enough devils in heaven hell that can stop you from living for God. Well, they said, now you need, this all happened in one morning, just one day. They said, now you need to get baptized in Jesus' name. I said, I've been baptized. They said, but you've not been baptized in Jesus' name. I said, why in Jesus' name? And you said, by immersion, not sprinkling or pouring, but by immersion. Not as a baby, but as an adult. I said, why by immersion? And you told me, when John walked out into the water with Jesus, he did not carry a cup with him. I said, why in Jesus' name? Now, now, you wonderful people were so quick with your scripture. And please, if you have any question concerning your identity, let me clarify. You're the most wonderful people on the planet. I'm saying you're the most wonderful people on the planet. You were so quick with your scripture. I said, why in Jesus' name? And you said, neither. Is there any other name given among men whereby you must be saved? I said, then take me to the water, but don't pour water on my head. Don't sprinkle water on my head, but put me under the water and put me under the water in Jesus' name. Well, I couldn't make you people happy. They said, now you need the Holy Ghost. By this time, the pastor had closed his Bible. The, the saints had forgot about the dinner. Now, they wanted this sinner to get the Holy Ghost. And I remember one brother saying, I'll stay here all day long as long as you want to seek the face of God. I, I said, you know, I'm good. There, was a, there is a cleansing in repentance. We need to be careful not, not to get them in the water until they have repented. You don't bury live people. But I felt clean. I felt like I had found what I had been looking for all those years. And then you said, let me tell you the story about Nicodemus. He came to Jesus, and Jesus said, unless you're born of the water and of the Spirit... You cannot enter the kingdom of God. I said, are you telling me, as good as I feel right now, that I could still go to hell? You never stuttered. You said you could still go to hell. I said, then I want the Holy Ghost. I got to the altar. I said, Lord, I need the Holy Ghost. Lord, 
There was a mother in Zion. Thank God for mothers in Zion. Thank God for fathers in the faith that was praying. That mother in Zion was praying close where I was. She said, praise him. Praise him. I said, God, they told me. She said, praise him. God, I, she said, praise him. I said, God, they, praise him. All of a sudden, I forgot that I needed the Holy Ghost. I forgot I wanted the Holy Ghost. I just lifted my hands, and just in a few moments' time, I began to speak in that heavenly language as the Spirit of God gave the utterance. <laughs> Pastor Will Banks, that's been 51 years ago, and I believe that qualifies me to say something. What would that qualify me to say? I believe it qualifies me to say, it's a good life living for the Lord. Would you stand with me this morning? If you believe that it's a good life living for the Lord, why don't you stand to your feet? Why don't you lift your hands? Come on, somebody. Come on, somebody. Three or four days after God filled me with the Holy Ghost, I went to visit my friend Leo Gregoire. I said, Leo, I found what I was looking for. I said, but I need to go to confession. Then I saw a little twinkle in his eye. He told me, he said, I heard what happened Sunday. He's coming back. I said, Leo, don't, don't get too excited. I'm not coming back. This is my confession. I want to confess that one day I went to an old-fashioned apostolic altar. I want to confess that I repented of my sins before the high priest. I want to confess that I was baptized in Jesus' name for the remission of my sins. I want to confess that God filled me with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. I spoke in other tongues, and I want to confess it's joy unspeakable and full of a glory. Pastor, if it's all right, we'll open the altar. Can we come? There's room for everyone. Maybe you weren't studying for the priesthood, but you know where God brought you from. You know when you was baptized in Jesus' name. You know the place and the hour that God filled you with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. So why don't you come? Why don't you stretch your hands out to him? Why don't you tell him that you appreciate him, that you love him, his hand, has been upon you. His hand has been upon your family. If you're blessed, just go ahead wherever you are and stretch your hands unto him. Let's exercise the ministry of saints right now. Come on, everybody find somebody. Let's minister one to another. 